Today, I have the esteemed pleasure to be with my friend Weather Girl from Twitter, but we've also gotten a chance to link IRL. Shout out to you. And there's so many different ways in which I think you, you got into the liberty movement, or if that's too much of boxing you in, into at least thinking differently than maybe some of the cultures that we grew up in and around. So why don't you introduce yourself to everybody and then we could uh, definitely plug your your videos and handles at, at the end as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Weather Girl, Weather CH4 on Twitter. And yeah, I, I work in video mainly and I do side projects. So I think we discussed one of them last time we saw each other. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. So how did you get into the broader liberty space? And I, I know you were saying that there might be new ways in which you're, you're formulating those ideas or saying that. So don't let me put words in your mouth and go ahead and tell us in your own words. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess I definitely have called myself a libertarian in the past and I still associate with a lot of libertarians. I mean, I'm even involved with the free state project to an extent um, oh wow yeah uh i was there last year and, and for those uh, who don't know could could you let them know what they're doing out there in new hampshire uh yeah so they're they're trying to get uh libertarians and liberty-minded people all to move to new hampshire um to kind of maintain i guess a lot of libertarian values that are already in place there, but maybe to grow them a bit. And I mean, in my mind, it's, I, I still would really advocate for people like minded people to move closer to each, each other. Yeah, I, I, I always was sold on the idea like they have a population of about 2 million or less at small scale. The state motto is live free or die already. So you got that little bit of Patrick Henry, you know, whether it was uh, fully hypocritical or not, you know, the, the rhetoric is beautiful. So it, it kind of was like fertile ground for, for people to get into local, local politics, local, local seats of power and, and try to affect change. I remember one of the funniest campaigns that I ever saw coming out of the Free State Project is there was a, a band of uh, no good libertarians who are going around putting coins in the meters of yeah. people where they're getting parked and the the state was trying to sue the shit out of them because they're like we're losing revenue money on all the tickets that we could have been gotten when they were literally I, doing acts of charity i know i wonder on what grounds would they have to say that you can't do that <laughs> um you know you've got to probably cite some sort of insurrectionary language like president trump did maybe recently and and maybe you got to say that it's like an in, an intentional coup of the of the revenue of the state. You know, maybe say that right. it's it's challenging the the basic authority of the state. You know, S saying saying basically that even if the action is good, the intent behind it is is somehow nefarious. Right, but I mean, you're on public property. Um, I just wonder, like, oh, does this mean this? meter is assigned to this car for this period of time i maybe or this owner of this car i mean you could be that person's friend and come and feed the meter for them oh for sure for sure i mean it, it was definitely organized you know <laughs> people could yeah. tell it was an organized effort it wasn't like spontaneous acts of kindness i i spent some time in north dakota and when I was out there, one of the most hilarious things I saw is on the billboard, it would say, be nice. And they weren't advertising anything. They were just trying to like advertise being moral, being good somehow. Mm -hmm. And um, I found that funny, like whoever would go out of their way to pay to advertise that. But that was definitely not the situation in um, in New Hampshire. But but you said um, you, you had some leanings towards that, but ha have you formalized another category or, or are you... I just, beyond categorization yeah that's basically it i i i guess part of the the issue is that there's so many libertarians telling you you're not a real libertarian if you think <laughs> this or that and um then after a while you're like okay fine and i won't be a libertarian if i can't just think you know 
or have genuine ideas about things. So. I see. So it's, yeah, it's not like you had a, a giant political orientation change, but you you know, people are trying to delineate, you know, who who's in or out. Is it like the minarchism, anarchism debates that you're more talking about? Or is it like, you know, issues of police and, and immigration or? Yeah, probably all of that. I think um, it, a lot of it is not that I wouldn't want an anarchist society but i i don't sometimes see how it could practically work and so i come at it from that angle it's not that i'm actually against it you know um and i think i do agree with certain things that are in place even if i don't like how they're being done yeah i i understand i i think um any of these labels if i'm going to be charitable to the postmodern movement any of these labels have got to be conversation starters. They shouldn't be conversation closer, like whether it's libertarian, anarchist, anarcho-capitalist, whatever word you're using, it should be like, okay, now let's have a conversation, not like, oh yeah, let's walk away from each other or, or that's the end of the conversation. I've always found myself more attached to Austrian economics, which I did view as more of a science. And I know not everybody in Liberty is a fan of that, you know, I've heard like yeah. people like Matt Welch and reason and stuff said like, they've never been interested in picking up an Austrian text. But for me, I, I got into the this general movement in high school, when I would have been suspicious of, you know, the type of person Ron Paul was to me, you know, I'm like a young black male, seeing an older white male Republican, not the typical person I would be interested in. But I just saw him spitting facts after facts after facts about CIA blowback, about the endless uh, wars and about the destruction of civil liberties. You know, some of the things like some of my favorite artists like Immortal Technique and others had been saying. Mm -hmm. um, and I was a fan of Dennis Kucinich even. I, I kind of liked Obama at the time, but I liked yeah. Dennis Kucinich way more. And Ron Paul seemed to be this hardcore version on, on that side. And then he got me, you know, to eventually pick up you know, his book and the Fed, uh, Mises is human action and things like that. So it's always been easier for me to identify with Austrian economics than any particular political position. And one of the more interesting, I think, recent developments in, in that regard is I've been listening to a lot of Curtis Yarvin lately and, you know, had him on, on my program here to discuss Ethiopian history because I heard him name dropping Ethiopian books and books about Ethiopia without anybody, you know, asking him follow up questions. And I was like, yo, I got follow up questions. And I know you were telling me you you had uh, visited one of his IRL events. What was that like? It was really cool. I mean, I, I already had um, known of him for maybe a couple of years and I had watched a lot of videos about him breaking things down, but I found his blog difficult to read. Mm -hmm. And what I appreciated was that at the event, he actually said that he, he purposefully did that. So it, it made me feel a bit better about not being able to really comprehend the blog. Same. But I like the concept. Like, um, it, it does, because I, I do think it's very, it's clean. And it's orderly, which I think is necessary, even if we don't always, um, you know, aren't always seen as being uh, appreciative of that as anarchists or libertarians. You know what I mean? Yeah. And th those seem to be incompatible, right? Like the one is a radical populism that trusts each individual to be an island unto themselves and kind of has um, endless deliberation. And the other is like almost going back to a platonic philosopher king where you're like, let's just put all our trust in one dude or dudette who's ready to just get things done and is not gonna compromise, like is, is only looking for, one of the phrases I caught along that event you got to attend, I followed along digitally later, was he kept focusing on on the health of the state. And I think there are some funny clips that maybe were taken out of context, but where, you know, he said he would be like, he would have been a Bernie bro. 
And, you know, you see later him talking about in other spaces that since his family worked for Jim Crow Joe, Joe Biden, that he's going to be going to he's going to be, you know, voting for him or rooting for him or, or giving him funds or something or at least giving him verbal support. Um, because that way the system crashes faster and we, we move on to something more orderly. Is that like a, a collapsitarian-ish? Yeah, yeah, collapsitarian, accelerationism. Right, I, yeah. <laughs> and I, I remember a while back there was this documentary called Collapse with Michael Rupert. Do you know uh-huh, how to go? I didn't see it, how to go. Oh, um, yeah, it was basically, he was the guy that exposed the CIA selling crack in LA. Dang. Do you know about that? Um, I mean, I've he- I've heard about it all the time. You talk about in the eighties, right? Yeah, eighties or nineties, maybe eighties. Um, but he was a cop, I think. He was in LAPD and exposed it. Um, and then this documentary was basically just him sitting in the middle of the room, uh, in an empty room, breaking down all this inevitable collapse of society stuff. I haven't watched it in a while, so I don't exactly remember everything that he was saying but at the time i was obsessed with it and because i wasn't scared listening to everything that he said which i think that was naive because <laughs> I, i'm definitely not that way anymore I, I i guess i used to want something like that to happen so i could kind of like it was a challenge mm-hmm. um but the reality of that is would be so brutal <laughs> Yeah, so I hear him talking a lot about the Czech Revolution. And in the Czech Revolution, you know, the history books, and it's funny because this is like some of the stuff I I studied independently more when I was in political science back in the day. And and hearing him talk about it, like it fleshes out some of these ideas further. But the the Velvet Revolution. And so when the Iron Curtain fell and the Soviets, uh, their regime is collapsing, the Czechs had... a a few consistent voices who were critiquing the regime at the time. And one of those voices actually was chosen to be president at this time and ended up being really effective. But the point was there was no bloodshed. Um, People weren't put on trial like during Nuremberg and people's pensions just, you know, continued to be paid out. I think that same thing was happening with the, with the East Berliners uh, as well in Germany. And they kind of just kept the status quo in terms of keeping stability and order, but they transferred the power to a totally different way of governance. So I think like, like you're saying, there's one collapse or accelerationism that goes Mad Max, but there's another one where it's just like, no, just like give up the keys and let somebody else drive. I know. Yeah. That has been explained to me that accelerationism can just be, uh, the collapse of the current system. So, um, you know, that's, that's a different situation, of course. And that's less scary. It was, it was interesting hearing you talking about it from artistic point of view too, because you're an artist. Do you, do you self-describe as videographer or photographer or what, what, what do you, what do you uh, um, refer to yourself I as? I don't even always call myself an artist. I think I'm more of like a crafts person <laughs> in a uh-huh. way, but um yeah i mean mainly i do editing but i i produce uh stuff as well um so can you tell us a little bit about the style that you were saying like expanding a little more about what you're saying i know you said it's been a while about collapse and then maybe segue that into the the cody wilson video that you edited yeah well um so i mean i grew up in massachusetts where everyone there is basically a democrat and my mom raised me to be a leftist and she's always hated on Republicans and blamed them for everything. And she kind of still does to this day. Uh huh. And then, um, and those are Mitt Romney Republicans, right? (laughs) Yeah. And George Bush. And that's the thing, like when around nine 11 and everything, I, Became, you know, when it first happened, I'd say I was pretty patriotic, but then quickly after I, I kind of became more anti-war. But at the time, I thought it was more of a Republican thing. But then when Obama came in, I realized that it's a bipartisan effort. Um, so that kind of opened my mind to what was going on. 
in government. And then I actually watched the Obama deception. Oh, is that by Alex Jones? Yeah. And I don't even remember it that much, but I just know that it, it opened my mind to maybe Obama's not that great of a guy because I, I did vote for him the first time, mm -hmm. but I was already, uh, a bit conspiratorial because even way before that I read, um, William Cooper's Behold a Pale Horse. I haven't heard about that one. What's that one about? It's, uh, I, I was, it was a long time ago when I read it, but it just goes into all kinds of crazy conspiracy stuff. Uh -huh. And, uh, I think, uh, one of my mutuals is talking about going through it and doing a, like a presentation of sorts on it, but it just laid the groundwork for me questioning these things. Yeah. And so I'd say politically that kind of pushed me away from the two party system. And then in 2012, Ron Paul was running. And I really liked him, but I, I didn't, and I voted for him, but I didn't know what libertarianism was at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and then WikiLeaks happened, which I really liked because I, I knew that I didn't like oppression. Yeah. And when that happened, I was like, holy shit, they just got the upper hand on the government. I, I was just really inspired by it. Yeah, I think and we were then, very similar. You had like a general tendency to be anti-authoritarian. It sounds like like you put the civil liberties stuff, like the issues I hear you mentioning are like civil liberties and war. So it I makes got, sense that you came from a Democrat background like me too. You know, my parents are still CNN and NPR fans, you know, right? That's like what raised me. Yeah. Um, and I, but I think I've always been anti-authoritarian, even in school and stuff. Um, and maybe to a fault. I don't know. <laughs> because I, my mom, she didn't uh, discipline me maybe as much as she should have. But I think her theory was that she wanted me to be really creative. And she felt mm -hmm. that, um, that that might inhibit it. I don't know if that might be a cope for her, but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I, uh, I've de definitely got disciplined. Won't get into the specifics uh, so they don't uh, right. <laughs> call right. the feds on them for, after the fact. But, uh, but I, you know, maybe I'm a little less creative than you, but we turned out the same way. It's funny you say that. I, I look at like, you know, I was in a group, you know, whatever, in elementary school, we used to call it NFR, no fucking rules. In middle school, <laughs> I remember getting, you know, suspended for yeah. like, fighting at one point they put me in a room they're like do you have a gang you know what i mean like yeah. <laughs> uh, i was one of the only people that had their lockers taken away we had this like giant bin for people who didn't have it and like people used to just call me homeless you know what i mean hello bin is the same bin as the the lost and found for people's clothes so you have all these raggedy clothes where you put your your basketball and that was their way of like embarrassing you and i remember writing like papers and stuff um from back then so maybe maybe there's like a genetic disposition we have or something to be contrarian well yeah i mean i don't know if i consider myself contrary but yeah i guess i i can uh relate to like a lot of these people that say they don't want to wear masks i mean even though mm -hmm. i wear it i can understand that they you know i don't necessarily like being told what to do i think i'm more reasonable about it now than i used to be but mm -hmm. um yeah i mean when i was in school too i, I was actually in a girl gang <laughs> i lived in the okay i lived in the suburbs like these girls had copied um some girl gang they saw on one of the talk shows uh-huh and uh i think at the time i was kind of bored with my group of friends so i kind of uh just migrated over to them for a bit and uh we got into trouble we were like smoking and drinking in middle school and <laughs> um yeah i got kicked off the washington trip so oh dang dc or the state of dc yeah So you were a cool kid from back in the day? I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I wish that I had done more, I guess I had done better in high school and maybe done more extracurricular activities because I went to a school that was really good. 
for our mm -hmm. public school. It was one of the best around, but I just kind of wanted to hang out with my friends more. Hey, I mean, that's that's part of the the freedom. At least if <laughs> if if we're saying freedom is our ideal, part of freedom, I think, is being an intellectual when you want to, and then you know, just doing things for the feels, just doing it for the lull sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I think there is a social uh, learning that goes on, so it's not it's not all a waste, you know. Yeah, I keep listening to the School Sucks Project and different, um, was it Kara McDonald is a, is a writer from Cato. Different people are talking about the subject of, of unschooling. You know, I've already been into the idea of various private schools, independent schools, micro schools and home schools. But lately I've been pushing myself, like you said, I, I was excited when you said, you know, you changed your idea because, you know, for adults to change their ideas, you don't see that often. So I think it takes a certain amount of openness to to be examining whatever evidence. You know, it doesn't mean we're always changing in the right direction, but just the fact that you're open to changing after you're an adult yeah. where everyone else is set in your ways, you know, that's uh, exciting to me. And I see myself entertaining the idea of unschooling where, you know, it's like people have less and less control and kind of just letting kids pursue those those social interactions, like you said, in a way that um, is, is pushing their autonomy from a younger age. Yeah, um, I definitely had a lot of freedom when I was younger. I wonder how I would be as a parent because I don't know. I I'd still w might want a bit more, um, not control, but involvement. Mm -hmm. So it's a balance, I would say. Yeah, Malcolm Gladwell, he talked about this interesting thing that a lot of people who get really famous or really rich, you know, they come up from some struggle, they overcome some struggle. And then when they have kids, they try to make an environment that's so cushiony for their kids yeah. that their kids, you know, I, I think there's even famous like terms for them, like like trust fund babies and stuff like who who just don't end up as disciplined, don't end up as incredible because the environment is part of the reason why those people became incredible. In I've noticed place. that about a lot of like celebrities, children, they kind of don't turn out as good. You know? <laughs> yeah. You, you almost have to expose them to a little bit of danger, a little disorder, a little yeah, chaos. For sure. You know? Yeah. I mean, you got, you have to let them develop on their own to an extent. I mean, you, you want that person to the, whoever they are to come out over time. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And, um, you said you work on different projects at, at any time. Do you, do you have any new ones that you could give us any, any sneak peeks of? Uh, I'm working on a documentary right now about, I won't, go into too much of it but it has to do with like 80s aesthetics and nostalgia which is very on brand for me obviously oh yeah yeah that's what that's definitely one of the the big draws to your twitter for me is that's always been an aesthetic i like you know yeah. the the kind of vibe of stranger things um and 90s and 80s parties yeah. for me like dark colors with neon like even this google meet we have like this black back screen and then when each of us talks it's got like a a neon or teal um, highlight over yeah. over our names or our, our AVs. And I really like that. I don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> what does it look like on your end? Uh, it's just the, the H in the circle. Oh, OK, screen. OK. I think you probably got to turn highlight mode on. I got oh. highlight speakers on. So every time one of us speaks, it'll put a, a teal square. We'll see actually what the recorded quality is like. I don't, I don't, I don't know if the recording throws up the highlighting. I know, uh -huh. I know it only shows the speaker at a time, which is a little different than Zoom, which kind of shows the grid view. Yeah, I think you can go back and forth on Zoom. You can change that too. Yeah, thankfully uh, we will not get bombed though. Sorry, what were we right. gonna say? <laughs> uh, it's interesting because like I, I see myself as overly nostalgic in general but um we were doing some research because i have a, a partner that i'm working with on it she actually mm -hmm. has done a documentary uh that cody was featured in 
before before the new radical there was one called no control Mm -hmm. and uh so she's worked with him and that's how we know each other but uh we were researching about nostalgia and i thought it was interesting to find out that some of it you know nostalgia is like not wanting to be in present time Mm -hmm. and i would always view that as a negative thing you know like you know Eckhart Tolle no the name is familiar though he's really great he did this book called the power of now and it Mm -hmm. talks about existing in the present moment and how that will make you happier and practicing mindfulness and it's very true but I think there is a certain benefit in um in nostalgia or there's a certain need for it if you're not happy with the current state of things Mm -hmm. um it can be comforting so we're kind of exploring those those themes with involved is involved with um i don't want to get into too much of it but yeah yeah no no (laughs) you you don't you don't have to give away the the whole yeah uh, sink in the kitchen right now it was just a, a snack or a little bite that you're offering us it's fun well, though. It's 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 coming along pretty well so far. Well, yeah, for sure. Let me know then, and then you know we could jump on again and give a more direct promo. But I will, yeah, once we because we want to try to pitch it around, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as you know, a lot of things that are going on right now. I think that I my views don't exactly align with. The, a large part of the libertarians people like El- eric july and dave smith are pretty in alignment with what i think so it makes me feel better uh-huh. that you know there are people in the liberty movement that think in my way they might be seen as more right-leaning and maybe i am so <laughs> that's fine yeah i think the the right and left there are so many arguments about it i i never liked it unless it goes back to the the like etymology and history of it and the ones on the left were bastiat and proudhon like they literally sat on the left in the french revolution and the folks on the right are really the apologists for the for the ancient regime for the ancien regime for the for the louis the 16th and the louis the 15th and 14th so for me I've always considered kind of conservatism and progressivism to be the intellectual children of that and all the various ANCOMs and ANCAPs and and all that stuff. You know, it's why Nassim Taleb in his book, Skin in the Game, which I'm reading right now, in the beginning, he gives a shout out to Ron Paul and to Ralph Nader. I worked for Dennis Kucinich while loving Ron Paul. Mm -hmm. You know, how does that make sense if one's a Democrat, one's a Republican? you know, or one's a libertarian and one's a green party. I think it makes sense because of the the general tendency that you're yeah. describing. On particular positions, I could see why, you know, things that become more debatable, like I think borders and abortion have always been yeah. like those things that people ha- have been divided the most. And, and it typically goes by where you're from but i've i've seen dave smith live too when he came to la he came to one of the liberty on the rocks events you know and and he comes from that yeah he comes from that democrat background too but something about like fatherhood you know his father's day recently fatherhood you know and and i think also part of that is his circle of friends are conservative christians and and he jokes about that too right you know he's jewish but he jokes about being a conservative christian because he has friends like tom woods and stuff and lou rockwell um, but you know, I, I've heard them, you know, maybe come around on one side of those issues and, and, you know, they've thought deeply on them. So it's not like a willy nilly decision. Yeah. So I, and, I get what you mean. Yeah. Me and Dave have very, very similar backgrounds and, and have evolved in similar ways over the past four years. So it's really strange how much we align and even on like very specific issues, um, so, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, no, that's, that's valid. You know, it's valid. I mean, you have, um, I had Whitney Davis on, on this program and she's the organizer for libertarian candidate for president, Joe Jorgensen in the state of Washington. 
She yeah. was reporting to me from her time in Chaz. Now, now they're calling it Chop. I've got another friend, Josh Friedman, out there right now. Shout out to him. He's he's got live footage of it even from today. But uh, she was telling me about the Libertarian Party politics, you know, and there's like the Mises caucus, but then yeah. there's the Socialist caucus, and there are the moderates, you know, who are really just like Republicans cool with legalizing weed. You know what I mean? So there's so much breadth and depth that unless you're like a straight up, you know, Nancy Pelosi, Mitt Romney type of Democrat or Republican, I at least personally, I would give people leeway. I think there's like reasonable leeway you're allowed to have on on certain issues. Yeah. And it just become it would just become questionable after a while. But also it's legit if you don't, you know, if you don't want to subscribe a label to it and and just right. kind of throw down your ideas. Well, I uh, all I can do I think that my politics or, you know, whether I feel that I even want to be political or not have evolved uh, in alignment with my personal values. And I'm the type of person that's always uh, trying to improve myself and change accordingly. So I can only go based on that. And um, I also think that a lot of things that I support are things that I believe I would have in my little ANCAP community if I had mm. one, which I don't think anybody in the movement would have a, a problem with as long as it's voluntary. Yeah. I just kind of think I'm consistent about it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, you know, Ron Paul would be famous, for example, for wanting to decriminalize heroin and weed, but he would never use either one. Right. And I think you're kind of saying yeah. you would only want to legalize the things that, that you would also do or would be comfortable with having around your neighborhood. Well, that's what it is. I, I don't think that I would want that in my neighborhood. So, you know, as much as I don't want to tell someone else what they can do for themselves, I have to also think about my space and my environment. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I get that. And that, that makes, that makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also, you know, as, uh, as far as the police and I've, I've tweeted about this recently, um, you know, there's so many people in the sphere that are always like, don't ever call the cops. Don't ever call the cops. And I just think that's probably coming from someone who's never genuinely needed to, which I have mm -hmm. before a few mm -hmm. different times, either for myself or for someone else. And so I think that that is kind of harmful to to try to impress upon people, and I think naive to an extent. Yeah, I'd, I've definitely come from the abolish camp, yeah. but I've been asked before by people who are like reform. And for me, and this has been repeated by a lot of people, but there's a reason NWA never came out with a, a song called Fuck the Firefighters. You know what I mean? Nobody's mad at them. Right. You know, from an Austrian economics point of view, you could probably say, hey, firefighters are probably not the most efficient way to fund them are through the ways they're currently being funded. And maybe the market price wouldn't be, you know, the salaries they're making nowadays. It's, it's hard to say. But one thing I could say is people don't have this hatred for them. And I think with the police, it, it happens to be all of the unjust laws and the the lack of accountability like the unjust laws yeah. that they're forced to enforce and the lack of accountability like even the the murder and rape and and theft solvency rates are so low because they're focusing on so many like the, like the, just the breadth of tasks that they have to go be enforcers for is so much so i almost think like you know robert nozick wrote about it years ago calling it a night watchman state if you just gave them a few tasks I think that you could salvage them to make them at least as lovable or neutral as firefighters. Um, I just think that those tasks for them are always going to involve a more, um, more hostile situations by nature. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we'd have to see how that plays out to know whether that's going to affect public opinion of them based on how they act in those situations. Yeah. I'm, I'm super, I'm super curious. Um, 
I got I gotta head out now, but I've loved this. Yeah. Whenever your next project comes out, please, please hit me up and we're gonna have another one of these, okay? Okay, sounds good. Perfect. Thank you. No problem. Bye.